it's the same thing as like the millennial pause. Have you heard the millennial no, pause? It's like when somebody starts filming you and then some of the way it's like two beats and then it's like, hey guys. Well, well, <laughs> Gen people, Z doesn't do that? No, You're not supposed to do that? No, because they'll do on TikToks and the minute that they hit it, they're like, and hey guys, what's up? Uh, Welcome back to whatever. Mm. And then you're filming someone and it's like the millennial pause of like, whatever, quit hating. Mm-hmm. It's not our fault. Our, uh, our not, internet not, wasn't as fast. Don't worry. I, I respect the lag. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to TikTok Theology, a podcast that tackles the major trending topics on social media that concern the Christian faith. I'm Megan. And I'm Steven. We know you can't form a theology in three minutes or less, but those videos can identify current issues. TikTok will give us the prompt and then we'll do a deep dive. Thanks for joining us in this exploration. Welcome back, friends. Today we will be discussing free will and predestination. Yeah. Good stuff we got going on today. Digging into that. I have a question, Megan. Yes, I have an answer. This is super old. This mm-hmm. issue is very, very old in <laughs> theological studies. Why do people care about it all of a sudden again? You know, I think that the concept of of free will and predestination has been around forever, but things, you know how things have their time. They circle back around like mm-hmm. all of the Gen Z pretending that we invented nineties fashion. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes. I'm like, Give I'm some justice. Like, I'm wearing, I'm wearing mom jeans and my mom's like, don't pretend, yeah. don't <laughs> pretend girl that you, that you did that. I did mm-hmm. it first. Um, and so I think that the concept of like predestination stuff plays a lot into, well, is there any point to what I'm doing in like on the earth right now? Like, do okay. my decisions have, uh, have an impact on anything because so, I think that like Gen Z are really in like are really thinking we, we were like ah, like what's our purpose like that makes sense are, what are, what's what's our point in life and so there's this like it's question, an existential question yeah of like is, does anything I do matter if I if mm. or has like some higher power already decided where I'm gonna end up at the end of this so mm-hmm. I'm gonna just kind of do my thing and then whatever happens happens. It's already been predecided. That's, that, that makes sense. You know, um, when I teach philosophy and this has been going on forever, literally mm-hmm. forever. So, and like, not just me before me, like every, like philosophy professors know college students get especially interested yeah. in existentialism. Yeah. And because they're dealing with like those questions, like w- what is my purpose and why do I exist? And yeah. that's what existentialism Well, they're becoming do. adults for the first time. And now they're like, right. huh, what right. do I do now that I'm like, having to do it myself. (laughs) So this is an existential question for Gen Z. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yep. We're getting real existential over here. (laughs) Right. Okay. (laughs) So, um, let's, uh, let's talk about the problem then. So it's an existential issue, which should tell us a little bit about how we should answer this when we talk to people. Right. But for this episode, let's go ahead and talk about some of the theology behind it just to give foundations for it. I guess. Absolutely. Um, Hey, they've been talking about this for, thousands of years for, yeah for li- there's forever. a lot of good things to say about this <laughs> probably nothing new i can add but a lot that i can reference <laughs> yeah so i mean uh calvinists root their idea of predestination back to um augustine mm-hmm. saint augustine so that's fourth century you know like forever ago and some of them would be right you know be like nah paul we're gonna go all the way back to <laughs> we're going paul, all right? we're throwing it all the way back to paul <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come but, on somebody <laughs> but calvin definitely used augustine a lot and that was kind of like a, a a huge influence on it so essentially you have calvinists that hold to have you ever heard of tulip the, the acronym that sounds familiar okay so tulip is like an acronym of the five points of calvinism that essentially talks about all that what calvinists hold so John Calvin, you know, uh, a reformer came after Martin Luther mm-hmm. and um, known as kind of one of the earlier radical reformers helping us to um, uh, break away from Catholic tradition and stuff like that. And, right. And one of his ideas or, or several of his ideas um, led to the formation of Tulip. Now, he didn't say Tulip himself. His followers kind of like synthesized his ideas into it. Yeah. I love so, a good acronym. Yeah. You know, it helps. So, um, so number one is total depravity. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good one. And so what it means is that it's not like you're totally depraved in the sense of like you're born and you're cussing out the doctor, right? Slapping him right out the womb, right out the womb. It's not like that. Dropped an F bomb. You're like, Oh my gosh, (laughs) what it actually, (laughs) yeah. Like, man, that's a totally depraved (laughs) depraved baby. baby. (laughs) So what they're, what they're saying is that sin has affected every aspect of our lives, right? Every aspect of our reality. So we are unable to respond to grace because sin has affected everything. It's right. affected our sight. Uh, like if we're thinking about it, like kind of 
um, you know, like an analogy, like you can't see it. You're, you're, you've got these blinders, blinders. on, right? Because yeah. sin has affected everything. So the you is unconditional election. So God wills it and brings it about. So um, the L is limited atonement. Only those who are predestined will be atoned. Mm. The I is irresistible grace. So you can't say no if you're elect. And the P is for perseverance, which is once saved, always saved, essentially, if you were to... Anti-apostasy kind of sitch. Yeah. I mean, there's more to it in the definitions and stuff. Um, but, um, but yeah, essentially, that's what it is. Yeah. And so the T and the P are held by a lot of free will people also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the T especially. Um, right. The P... Um, and I think we'll, we'll talk about this at a later episode, but like, that is like, if you freely choose to go into the covenant and then the covenant, you can't leave it. You could still have free will cause you freely chose to go into the covenant. Right. So there could, you could be free will theist mm-hmm. and believe in perseverance. Right. Um, but you could also not, you could also believe that you can lose your salvation. Right. So that's the different, the problem is the Uli the Uli part of Tulip. The Uli. <laughs> it's the U-L-I. So those are... Um, the un- yeah, unlimited... Yeah. The something, something predestinated. Yes, yes, yes. So those are the ones that um, that speak to... Like, for example, Limited Atonement says... That, that, I don't even like that. No, I, it, I hate everything about the co- Limited Atonement. The, I mean, the idea is that... I don't love that statement at all. Jesus didn't die for everybody. For everyone. He just died for, for the elect. <laughs> yeah, for, for the elect. So like... Um, Free will theists believe he is a universal atonement. He died for everyone. Right. And then that you freely choose God. And there's tons and tons and tons of scripture that speak towards this. Even John right. 3, 16, you know, the, whosoever, our favorite one. Yeah, whosoever <laughs> believes in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. Right. So that's basically what Calvinists hold to. And there is biblical backing to what they're saying. It's not like they just like pulled this out of nowhere. Right. And there's also a philosophical backing and, but the big philosophical idea is like, okay, if God knows everything, then he's going to know who, yeah. Then how can you actually have free will? Mm-hmm. So if I were like offering you, Hey Megan, would you like this chocolate ice cream or this vanilla ice cream? Pick one. Chocolate. Chocolate. I think we did this already. We did this already. Yeah. So we got to bring and it And I back. stayed the same. <laughs> you stayed the same. Chocolate is still superior. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, and if, once again, if I said, here's the vanilla, you didn't have a choice. Right. And if you don't have the consequence of your choice, did you ever have a choice right. or just the illusion of a choice? Mm-hmm. And if God knows exactly like who you are that he's making, he knows all the choices you'll make and he still makes you the same way in the same circumstances anyways. Right. Did you ever actually make any choices? Right. So that is God's knowledge of everything. His, his sovereignty is mm-hmm. being over it all. Um, that could, it seems incompatible with our free will. Right. And then the biblical uh, reasoning, they usually go with Romans eight and nine. So let me read you one of the most famous passages. This is Romans 8, 28 through 30. And it says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So that's one of the main ones right there. Right. It says predestination God's right up in there. God's predestined in the name, right? <laughs> yeah. So like, uh, like it says the word. And so they're like, see, predestination. And then Romans nine also, uh, there's, a, you know, the whole, whole thing kind of speaks towards this where, why are you questioning things? You should trust God. And so like Romans nine, 19 through 21 says, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being to talk back to God? Shall that is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay, some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? All right. Something to think about. Something to think about. What do you think? What? So pre, I know predestination is, is, is an English word. And I don't know if you know this off the top of the dome, but what is the like original word? That like the Greek, the Greek, Dang yeah. It. Like, is okay. that what I know? I'm so sorry. I really just went fully off. I apologize, man. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I feel like you know when we make a lot of theological arguments about like the use of English words, mm-hmm. but it's like, was that what was originally meant when Paul wrote that? Like, did it mean predestination in the way that I think that's what? The, honestly, that is what's made me so like in my like theological education journey is I'm like, are we arguing about something that was never even 
really meant. <laughs> Are we arguing an English nuance that well, was never intended in, in the Greek and Hebrew? Um, so you know what's the truth is <laughs> I am not a biblical scholar. I am a constructive theologian. Mm. You know what language I had to learn for my PhD? German. Yeah, you did. So I didn't have to do... He said, I did not hit him with the Greek, with and, the Greek Hebrew. and Hebrew. Um, so um, determine before the council. It okay. means to like determine beforehand. Okay. Yeah. So it's okay. So it's okay. Cool. Just check in. All right. So, so I, I, so it's I, a similar issue. It is a similar issue. It doesn't seem like the Calvinists are often the usage of the word. So how do you reconcile that? Hmm. You what know, do you do with that? What do, what do we do with that? You know, I, I think, <laughs> I think for me, I had this like weird epiphany and like, my senior year of high school, my freshman year of college, probably mm-hmm. where I was like, when, I, when I was really thinking about like the concept of like free will, predestination, whatever God's sovereignty. Mm-hmm. And I was really, really thinking, I was like, okay, God knows. I feel like the sovereignty, and this could be total. You just go ahead and correct me if this starts to get real heretical. So okay. <laughs> if this starts to go a little offhand. So for me, I'm kind of like God's sovereignty. Like he knows the potential results of every combination of things that could happen Uh, in like of humanity. And I know that that sounds really crazy because that's like common view. That's like a human. It's Molinism. Right. And so I feel like the human mind that hurts a lot, like the concept Mm. of like things is we only make our one decision, but I feel like God so sovereign and like bigger than us that he can comprehend the infinite amount of combinations. Yep of decisions and things that people make. So he's like Dr. Strange. Yeah. Kind of almost multiverse kind of situation where it's like, God is so capable of being aware Mm -hmm. of what could happen depending on every decision that every person makes over like bit a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit. So I feel like that like hurts my brain a little, but for me, I feel like that, that is kind of how I reconciled free will with like God's sovereignty where Uh I'm like, every person has free will. God is just capable of, knowing all of the results of the free will decisions that anybody could make at yeah. any time. So that is not heretical. Okay, perfect. In fact, it lines up with um, <laughs> what Luis de Molina in the 16th century held, and that's uh, that's where it's called Molinism or middle knowledge. Uh, philosopher William Lane Craig holds to that now. So it's the two, the two can coexist, his free will and God's knowledge, if God knows how the human will will act if placed in a non predetermined situation. Oh, okay. So it's like, it's this like, feels good to be, to be affirmed by us. Yeah. So, <laughs> <by a theologian. laughs> so they have this idea that, um, that the knowledge beforehand is predetermined. The knowledge after is predetermined. The knowledge of the choice, this middle knowledge is not predetermined. Right. So it's called pre volitional post volitional. And then this like middle knowledge is what is open to us. So if there's a million different pathways, he knows all the responses to all, but we can choose which pathway we do. Right. So I actually don't hold to that view. Really? No, okay. I don't think it's, to me, it seems it's like too complex um, and unneeded. So. Okay. Yeah. What, where do you fall? So, but I do think it's a good view and I think it's a, it's a view that can work with people. So um, before I, I'll tease it like, like, um, like a little, I think there's a couple a little, of uh, other ones that are, are a little stronger. Okay. But before we even get to that, I want to look at Romans a little bit better in context. Okay. Cool. So, um, Set the stage. Yeah, because I don't know if they can be so assured to interpret Romans 8 and 9 Calvinists the way they do. Sure. And so, um, because the issue is Romans 8, 28, 30, it says, uh, or like 29, for example, says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So, and then it says, and we tend to leave this part out, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So that would seem more of a general hum- statement about humanity yeah. and less of a predestination of who's going to And evangelism. Love Jesus. How, right. If you're going to be the firstborn amongst others, then others are supposed, <laughs> are to, come supposed in. to come in there. Right? <laughs> right. And so um NT Wright, who's uh probably my favorite New Testament scholar, oh, I yeah. highly recommend him. He's awesome. Um he wrote about this and this is part of his fresh perspective on Paul. He said, basically, if you look at what Romans is about and what's Romans, what's the main point that Paul is trying to make in, in the book of Romans, like to the church of Rome, what is he trying to get the church of Rome to do? Do you know? 
<laughs> Did you know? It's it's like the I've heard it being like it's the like pathway to salvation kind of like it's the yes, whole concept. Yes, but for of, who? For who? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. Yeah. That was the big point. Was like it's it's about the radical inclusion of the Gentiles right. into the church. That's the argument he's making. He's, he does it in several books, but Romans is really, really this. It's that kind book. Of, it's like his masterpiece where he's saying this, right? right? And so if you look at that in the context, then being the firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters, he's talking to the elect. He's talking to the Jews, telling them that, th- that salvation was going to come through them, but it was supposed to be inclusive for others. Right. And that also gives you a new framework for how to think about Romans 9, when they're saying like, who are you to tell the boss, how to make uh, uh, pottery if it's for menial use or whatever. So that would be a reprimand almost of the Jews saying that, that God you can't couldn't make the bring Gentiles. people in. Mm-hmm. Exactly. He's doing the opposite of what Calvinists are trying to say. Which it would be interesting that, that they would pull these scriptures out of the context of Paul talking to, it would be a little weird if he was like, bring the Gentiles in over mm-hmm. the entirety of Romans and then be like, just kidding. Yeah. Like randomly in chapters eight and nine. Exactly. <laughs> Jokes. Actually, never mind. There is an elect and then go right back to it. <laughs> it totally lines up with what he's saying. And and it's you're you're the firstborn amongst me, brothers and sisters. And you gotta think about what are you predetermined, what are you predestined for? They're predestined for being conformed to the image of the Son. Right. So what will become of them through salvation is glorification, right? Right. And so that's still not who is glorified. You know what I'm saying? Like right. like uh what they're saying is, is the plan of God, the, the purpose that they're given. That is what's predetermined. And so those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. It goes through there. So I tend to think of like, uh, like let's say I'm the mayor of San Dimas. Okay. You know what I mean? And uh, in San Dimas, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to hold this great banquet. I'm going to invite everybody in all of San Dimas. Mm-hmm. And... Anybody can come. They don't have to, but I want them to go. The food's going to be great. You know what I mean? Yeah. But whoever comes has to wear these dope robes. <laughs> what did I predetermine? Who would show up? The robes. Or what they would look like right. after they're there, right? Yeah. And so um, he, you're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Right. That's what, what will happen to you. You'll be glorified. Right. That's what happens to the elect. Mm-hmm. But then what he's arguing is that, being the firstborn means you're bringing people in. Mm-hmm. So what's predetermined is what becomes of us. What's predetermined is his plan. Right. But what's not predetermined is who is who. Yeah. And so, and that's where they kind of, I think missed the boat a little bit on that, on a biblical, on a biblical thing. And there's right. just like so many passages where God is pleading for us to be saved or like, yeah. you know, there's passages where um, we mentioned John three sixteen, like there, there's so many passages that seem to be free will, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. And then the other thing is, don't people just like naturally act like free will is a thing? Yes. Like who goes around acting like things are predetermined? It, I've never met somebody. You know what I mean? Who does that? No. People will say it like a joke. They'll like slap somebody <laughs> and be like, ah, that was predetermined. God knew I was going to do that. Right. You know what I mean? Like a quirky little joke. Yeah. I've never, yeah, I've never actually met someone who was like, oh, well, I already knew that we, somebody knew this was going exactly. <laughs> to happen. Exactly. It's an interesting thought. Yeah. There was a 17th century Calvinist pastor, Jacob Arminius, who essentially said the opposite. He was talking about free will. So he's coming from the Calvinist tradition and he just can't reconcile that with scripture. He sees free will and human abil- and our human ability to choose as an in- integral to what he's saying, right? right. So there's like a bunch of scriptures that will say that atonement, for example, isn't just for the elect, but it's for anybody. Right. So look at this. First Timothy two, three through five. This is good and pleases God, our savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. You heard that? Wants all men right. to be saved. That's God's desire. Right. Like, is he duplicitous against himself? No. He desires all, but then only elects a few. Right. You know what I mean? That would be kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that doesn't make any sense right there. And the rest of that verse for, uh, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as ransom for all men, all, all. men, we the testimony given in its proper time. Yeah. Okay. Old Testament, Ezekiel 33, 
11 says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declare the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? So your God's pleading with them yeah. to turn, right? Right. Um, Matthew eleven twenty eight thirty, 28, 30, uh, Jesus says, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And it just keeps going. Like there's so many, like everyone and all. Like, oh yeah. Okay. The language is very inclusive. Right. And so, um, and in Paul too. So it's like, it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense, um, you know, for it to be otherwise, you know, the first Timothy passage, that's, that's Paul. Right. So anyways, that is kind of the biblical backing. So, I think what we're stuck with Mm -hmm. is with the reality, okay, we naturally believe this Bible seems to talk about free will, right? but we also do believe in God's sovereignty that he knows all things. Right. So how can we know, how can he know all things and us have freedom to choose? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you gave a very popular and powerful response, right? That's the Molinism. Yep. Right. And so it's good. I think it works. I don't think it's wrong. The reason why I don't like it is like, um, to me, it's like you have to, you're just adding a lot that you don't need to, in my opinion. Sure. So like, um, he said, I, it's simple. It's simpler than that. It's simpler. <laughs> I think it's simpler. Cause like there is, uh, I respect that. have you heard uh, uh, Occam's razor? Yes. Yeah. So that's like the, the simplest reason is probably the right one. If you're going right. to make an assumption, right? Yep. So like, if you're like planning, to a trip from California to Portland, what are you going to do? You're just going to drive. I'm just going to drive north. I don't know. Just going to drive north, right? Yeah. So you're not going to stop in Oklahoma and, and Nebraska and right and Texas right and uh, all these other places. You wouldn't assume to do all that stuff right. with the limited information that you have. Right. If you just have destination, this is des- this is the destination, and we're going there. Right. Then you're going to assume a straight shot. Right. And so to me. I feel like they're taking a scenic route with this. You know what I'm saying? I think it works. I'm on a, I'm on a journey. Yeah. But it's just like, (laughs) you're just assuming that there's endless amounts of choices and that we all can have, um, you know, that God knows all the outcomes and stuff like that. So, but I think it's a helpful thing if you believe in like multiverse stuff, or if you really like, you know, superheroes or something, you know what I'm saying? Like you watched Dr. Strange one yeah. time. You're like, I get it. It could be, helpful. I just get it all. <laughs> it, it, it could be, I understand it. It could be helpful. Crazy for sermon illustration. Right. <laughs> like just like you're up there and be like, now imagine now imagine a multiverse. Now imagine friends, but that Jesus is Dr. Strange, right? Right. So <laughs> there's two uh, versions that I think are a little stronger. Okay. And um, so I'll give you another one that I think is a little stronger, but I, I don't also don't believe this one. Oh, okay, go ahead. So I don't believe it, but I think it's a good one too. Okay. And it's uh, the open theistic view. Okay. Do you know about open theism? It's, I mean, I'm familiar with, like, I'm familiar with it probably. Yeah, it gets uh, crapped on sometimes. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) People are like, ah, it's wrong. But like, okay, I'm going to make a quick explanation of the open theism. Okay. So open theism holds, and and some of the people that hold it is like Clark Pinnock, Nicholas Wolterstorff, uh, Jürgen Moltmann was said to, mm, um, but he didn't. Not really, your guy. He's he's my dude. Not your dude. I, I love all these dudes actually, <laughs> but like uh, I'm not your guy. But he doesn't, he never explicitly says it. But um, so basically, the idea here is that the universe is open and expanding, and that's kind of like a scientific thing that we know. Right. Sure. Now the question is, how is God positioned in this? Mm-hmm. Is God outside of this expanding universe. Mm-hmm. So like, like it's contained in God's mind, but it's still expanding for our perspective. Right. Or is it expanding also for God? Hmm. And so the way Maltman, the reason why Maltman is called one of these is because he imagines God standing at the precipice of this expansion and drawing it into him. Interesting. So like, so he's outside of it, but he's just like barely outside of it. And it's like, it's expanding. And he's like, he's like drawing it away. You okay. know what I mean? Um, the classical theist view, the kind of regular Trinitarian, just classical theist view, sees it as a closed universe in God's mind. So like it's expanding from our perspective, but right. God sees it as just like, it's, it's a done deal. There's right. a, the past history and future. He knows it all, right? right? So with that being said, the open theist with an open view and he's standing outside, but right at the precipice, drawing it in, the reason why he doesn't know the future is because the future hasn't happened yet. And it's actually just illogical to say he knows the future. 
It's something oh. that doesn't exist. Okay. If God is drawing all time and space into him, the expanding universe. Then there is nothing beyond. There's nothing beyond that. Got it. Noted. That's a pretty clean view. Yeah. And it makes sense of like some people like, like in the old Testament when, when there seems to be prophecies and stuff, right? Right. They would say like, uh, like, um, this is uh, Clark Pinnock's argument. They would say, it's not that God is predicting what's going to happen. It's that God is promising what's going to happen. Right. Which is why when, when the people plead and cry out and he changes, like quote unquote changes. changes. Yeah. And, and they're, they're okay with the idea of God changing his mind. Right. Because it's not all predetermined. Right. And then they're also saying, oh, well, you know what? Um, so like, for example, if you said, um, if you do this, this will happen. God is warning you because he knows all things and he's still all powerful. Right. So he knows all things that can be known. Mm -hmm. The future can't be known. So it's not a limit to God. It's just illogical to say it. But then God, when God makes a future prediction, quote unquote, he is not predicting it as if he saw it. He's predicting it because he's still all powerful and he's right. promising and it. And he can make it. Yeah. He can make happen, it happen babe. that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's a view. I think that's a powerful view. The thing that it is contingent on is if in God's perspective, the universe is actually open. Right. And how can we possibly know that? Yeah. It does make a statement that we could not affirm. No, for sure. But we can't know <laughs> that it's closed either. Right. To God's perspective. We have no, we this, just, whoop. so this is it. So these are not, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck, but I think it's a good clean version that like, uh, that, you know, isn't as, overly complicated for no reason, like Molinism, in my opinion, humbly, if say. you hold it, it's all good. I do think it's a strong, a strong thing. I really, really respect sure. William Lane Craig, the philosopher. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so anyways, that is that one now. And if you think about it, open theism is in no way heretical or anything like that, it's because what did you actually modify? God is still creator. God is still outside of time and space outside of his creation, standing at the precipice, but still outside of it. God is still a redeemer. Right. God is still coming back again. These are all the primary Christian beliefs. The the Holy Spirit indwells the church. You yeah. know, every, all the primary beliefs are still there. Yeah. There's the fall, there's redemption, everything, right? Yep. The thing you're modifying is nothing of the nature of God. The thing that you're modifying is the nature of the universe, hmm. the nature of creation, which is not even a theological concept. So the nature of God is the theological concept. Right. And, and the nature of the universe is a scientific concept. So, right. so it's not heretical. Is it right or wrong? I don't know. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Eh, shrug. <laughs> so the view that I like the best. Though, okay, here we go. Um, that it, it, it is actually just kind of like the classic view with a Trinitarian assist. When we really understand the Trinity, I think it can help us to understand God's relation to time and space. Mm -hmm. So if we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we tend to think of God being outside of time and space, right? Right. But not totally, right? Right. Jesus was very much within time, in and, time and space, space right? You're right. And then the spirit, we don't think about the spirit being outside of time and space either. Right. We think about him in every time and every space. Right. He's ever present, right? Right. So in God, with the Father, we have God outside of time and space, holy other. Right. In Christ, we have God in a specific time in a specific place. Mm -hmm. And in the spirit, we have God in every time in, in every, every place. Hmm. Right. And so you can make your own decision, but God knows what it is because he's there. Right. So this is, so we got to take God out of our timeline. Hmm. So we, we imagine God as just like being like one of us, just being a little taller so he can see further ahead of what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. We got to take him out of that and then say, oh, God is actually with me in that moment too. Mm -hmm. And in the next moment and in the next moment. Right. So God knows all things, not because he caused you to do it, not because he foresaw it, but because he's in it. He's in every okay. moment. Right. Yeah. I like that one the best. I can get with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it doesn't even have to do with the close or the open universe. I think it's just the implication of a trinity. You know? Yeah. And think about how big God is when we think about God this way. God is outside of time and space, in time and space, and in every time and space. God is there. <laughs> huge, right? He's huge. God has become so much bigger than we can possibly imagine. Right. Our free will is preserved because it's not predetermined the way right. Calvinists would have solved this problem. Mm -hmm. The way Calvinists solved the problem is, yeah, no free will. 
That's, that's, their, that's their solution. Done. Perfect. You know, but no, we want to hold that God is sovereign, knows all things. Right. We also want to hold in free will. And so maybe this is the way. Maybe so. I don't know. What do you think? Are you convinced you still like your Molinism? I like, I like, I don't know. Maybe I'm complicated. Yeah. I like my complicated you answer. You like the I like my little complicated middle. Uh, hey, a lot of theologians. I like, my, I like my middle knowledge answer. I like a lot of theologians. I like, I respect like, I like, like your, it. I like the uh, Trinitarian theism though. I feel like it definitely hits a lot of points Yeah, for sure that make a lot of sense. I think all three of them work. And here's at least the final point that we can make out of this. Regardless mm-hmm. of which one of these work, they're all orthodox. I think they're all fine. Yeah. Regardless, it shows you that you can philosophically see. Oh yeah, sovereignty and free will is compatible. Yes, God's sovereignty you, and free will. It's like predestination is not like that. Doesn't have to be the. It doesn't have to be the answer. Doesn't have to be the answer. And it does. It doesn't. And and if, if we're reading Romans correctly as the radical inclusion of the Gentiles, right? Then it isn't the answer biblically. And there's other philosophical ways of knowing it. Right. You know what I'm saying? I I, I hear you. How do you think a Gen Zer would take? this would this be comforting and helpful i think it could be also i think the fact that there's three options almost Mm -hmm. that it's like look at this they got a la carte yeah kind of where it's Mm -hmm. like all of these there's no like you're not heretical in any of these they all perfectly align with scripture scripture and and they've got they don't jack with the character of god Mm -hmm. um and so i feel like there's a lot of and that's what i think sometimes is hard is like things about scripture or or christianity feel so black and white sometimes yeah. even how they're presented mm-hmm. by like maybe they've heard a pastor who's like things are this way yeah and what you don't think about all the time is like how many different like theological arguments there are for things that it's not very rarely and highly black respected and white. highly respected theologians holding holding totally different very views. different views yeah or they agree you agree with one theologian in one thing and not in another and so i feel like this would help in the understanding of not everything is so black and white Yeah. of like, of course there are things that are but, black and white. Well, what it is, I, I think what these it, issues, what it also tells you is like, there is an answer. Yes. There's an actual objectively true answer. Our ability to know it <laughs> is what is, is not clear. Right. right? Mm-hmm. So in our finite minds, we can't know exactly how God no. relates to time. And I don't know if we ever will. No. If God is infinite, how are we ever, like even in heaven? We will never to know. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll see a little bit better, right? For sure. Um, we'll see as if we're face to face, but we're still not going to be God. No. Right? And so one of the big problems I think is when people make these objectivist claims, you, you got to realize you're making the claim that you know it the way God knows it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's a little arrogant. Yeah. <laughs> so, but knowing things, knowing the limitations of our finite beings, I think is, it can give you comfort, but also like it doesn't, sometimes I think people might be lazy and they'll be like, oh, I don't know the answer. So I won't think about it anymore. Right. I'm just going to have to trust. No, these three views are kind of complex, Yeah. but they are solid views. They're, yes. You know what I'm saying? They are, they make a lot of logical sense. For sure. And so I think there's, answers that we can follow and still hold to the mystery of God. Yeah. You know what I mean? I love the mystery of God. I know it's really hard for people who like to know a lot of things, Mm -hmm. which I think is even like a Western thing. Yeah. Like we love to know answers to things. We love like justification and all that kind of stuff. And I feel like there is an element of faith that is just the mystery of God. Like I'm just never going to fully know it. But don't you think it's better and more comforting to have this sense of like mystery, but I know it's been demonstrated to me that an answer does exist. Yes. And I think that's what this helps. Yeah. Where it's like, it exists. We're not sure which of the three that is, or if it's some <laughs> or if combination it's, or, or if something it's another different. version or whatever, but there are, but there, there are, are answers. answers. Yeah. And that's helpful. <laughs> Otherwise people are going to come back to, you know, a Christianity doesn't make sense. They have these logical contradictions. Yeah. No, these are three uh, logical ways that it makes sense. Oh yeah. We don't know if it's, it's, if it's a hundred percent, but you can at least rest assured in the comfort that there is an answer. And it's why we need theology to mm-hmm. like, it's why the like, scholarship and theologians and like that calling is so valid and matters. Cause it's like, if you're just reading Romans eight and you see the word predestination, you're like, oh my gosh. Yep. I guess we're all predestined. Yeah. And oh my gosh. But that's why it's like the power of going 
to like the people who have studied scripture yeah. and being like, Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Like you can't, you are allowed to read the Bible and then also read other sources as well. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> you don't like you can read you version and then you can also go to a commentary Yeah, and you can also go to a, a paper or a book. Something like, that is peer reviewed. Yeah. Something that's know? like, it's not, that's not, you know, daily mail or yeah. <laughs> somebody's, somebody's random blog. dude in the basement. Yeah. Someone's blog or some random podcast. <laughs> so. Yeah. Or some random, random TikTok theology <laughs> podcast. Us, Imagine yeah. doing that, Yeah, but you can pursue education and knowledge and hey, we cite our sources. We got show notes. Don't worry, friends. Mm-hmm. We, <laughs> we got you covered, but yeah, I think I think that's really I think it's really powerful to have to have options good. to be like these things can be really there are these three options and they're all really good and I may not know which one but I feel like that it bring it definitely may brought my heart to ease and it might soothe your existential angst yes right very much soothing my existential angst which is what I mean it did for me and yeah. like I mean I'm not Gen Z I'm a old millennial old crusty millennial but <laughs> who says the but before yeah, things whatever, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, but you know uh, this is something that I had to hear too before I could feel comfortable yeah. in my faith. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Which is, which is different. I, I believed I had faith, but like, yes. but it was like faith that had a little anxiety attached to it. And then I felt, faith, but stressed. Yeah. It was like stress, faith, faith. but confused. Yeah. It was confused, <laughs> but that's the beauty. Like you can seek answers. Yep. You know, C.S. Lewis had um, a chapter in his book, Mere Christianity, which mm-hmm. I love. It's one of my favorite books. And I read it in high school and it got me like, like really attached to theology. Yeah. Got you on your theology. Exactly. (laughs) And he basically uh, traces out this, this idea of God being outside of time. And that's how you can understand uh, foreknowledge and free will. Yeah. And, but in the beginning of it, he says, if you don't find this chapter helpful, skip it, go to the next one. And, um, and I was like, that's kind of helpful. Because not everybody has an existential angst and these are like pretty philosophical, um, uh, worked Thoughts out reasons. Things. Yeah. It helped me a whole lot. It helped you. Yeah. But, um, for some people it's not that important. So, um, but and that's you okay know, too. as long as we can come to, to it, we're like, yo, God has made us in a way that we could choose him yeah. out of our own volition to love God, not yep. like robots, but we truly are choosing him. Yes. And then he also knows all things and is still sovereign. And these things can work together. I think that's beautiful. All right. Well, hopefully it helps. Yeah, hopefully some, it eases somebody out your there. existential angst today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, before we go, let's uh, let's remind the folks. This is uh, brought to you by LPU's College of Theology and Ministry. Praise God. All right. See you next time. See you next time.